In a wooded valley on the outskirts of Gateshead sits an unassuming building. But this building had a remarkable impact on England's industrial history. Originally built in the 1720s, Derwentcote Steel Furnace played an important role in the creation of steel, allowing for a huge step forwards in engineering and production. I'm Rob Bell, engineer and adventurer, and I'm travelling around England seeking out some of the key sites in this country's shift towards a more modern way of manufacturing and living. This steel furnace employed an early method of turning wrought iron into steel and was active for over a hundred years, up until the late 1800s. To find out more about the part Derwent Co. played, I'm meeting Mark Douglas, Senior Properties Curator from English Heritage. Mark, nice to meet you. You too. I'd say there's, there's so much more to this building once you step inside. Yeah, yeah it's great, isn't it? Yeah, it's fantastic. So tell me, when was this steel furnace operational? When, when was it active? It was active from the early part of the 18th century. We know probably from around about 1720. This is the earliest surviving example of a cementation furnace in the country. And that's what makes it incredibly important. Can you tell me a bit about the process of what went on in the furnace here? How, how you turn iron into steel? The main principle is you must not let air get to the iron because it will oxidise it. So inside this massive masonry, as you can see in front of here, there's two chests. In those two chests, they would pack bars of iron between layers of charcoal and then top the whole thing off with sand to, to, to make it airtight. And light a fire. There's flues going around the outside onto a dome ceiling and flues going underneath these two stone chests and basically heat them up to about 1,100 degrees and keep it at that temperature for between seven and 10 days. Then allow the whole to slowly cool down probably another two weeks. During that process, the iron inside there will absorb the carbon out of the surrounding charcoal and that would then create what we call blister steel because the whole surface would look like a pancake or blistered up like a pancake when it came out of the of these, these furnaces. And that would be then used to forge it through sheer steel and used to make the tools and down in the forge. What kinds of tools, what kind of implements might have been manufactured from, from the steel from this furnace? But anything with edges, anything with cutting edges, because it would hold an edge and it could be made a lot thinner, size and shears and also swords. And was, was this part of England then? intrinsically linked to steel production? And if so, what, why was that? Steel production it's in itself isn't really intrinsically linked to any one particular place. It can be done anywhere, right? All you need is the raw materials. What made this place important is geology and geography. Geology in the sense that we have access to raw materials, such as iron, but the main thing that made this different was the route between here and the continent, between here and Sweden the access to Swedish bar iron, which is an incredibly pure form of iron. So it was Swedish iron that was used yeah. and turned into steel here, not, not English iron? No, the British iron from around here was, was high phosphorus. The Swedish iron was incredibly pure. Well, how important was Derwent Coat then within the steel production of, of, of the greater area of the Northeast? Derwent Coat was one of many, many manufacturers around here but it was the development of this sort of process. It lasted a long time at Derwent Cut. But the valley itself, the Derwent Valley, at one point, it was the biggest ironworks in Europe. Over 50% of all the iron that produced in the country in the 18th century was produced in this valley. It was just a hotbed of furnaces and, 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 and steam and iron and smoke, you know? It had been an incredible place to be. Absolutely, yeah, it's very hard to imagine that, you know, when you're walking around yeah. here now. Were there other furnaces similar to this in other parts of the country? Then? Sheffield is the main protagonist. That somebody, probably a disgruntled employee, snuck off down to Sheffield and took the ideas. It wasn't the process itself, it was the technical bits in between that made the difference. Yeah. The people move to where the opportunities lay. It's an evolutionary process in a way. The process of producing steel by this method had been practiced for hundreds of years, but not on this scale. How big an employer was this steel furnace? I mean, who, who was working here? To run this would take you and that'd be it. So it's a one-man job, or probably a two-man job. And that, that was it then? The whole process from start to finish would be a vast employer. Making chains, making anchors. Here, they were making billets of steel. They're not taking this and finishing stuff off. Yes. They're producing a, a product then giving to somebody else. It was the bigger plants where they're doing everything. They took it from raw materials to finished product. And it was this hive of activity. 
But of course, unfortunately, by 1890, this place had gone, finished. The furnace had gone out, quite literally. The next evolution of the whole place was it was a, a road was driven through the whole forge to furnish a drift mine, coal mine. That's all gone. Now we've got a valley. When did English Heritage take guardianship of the Derwent Coach steel furnace and what condition was it in at the time? It was taken to guardianship in 1985 and it was in pretty poor condition. But it was also the rest of the landscape. It's also a schedule ancient monument. It's been afforded a level of protection by the state as well. And so what about the work that's required here at, at Derwent Coat in order to, to preserve this for future generations to come and enjoy and, and to learn about our industrial past? It's not a sort of building that's going to fade away quite quickly. It's a, it's a huge, substantial piece of masonry. The main thing you've got to do with these sort of buildings is keep the water out. Keep it dry, man, it'll, be, it'll last forever. Well, I hope so, because it, it, it's a really exciting part of our history and, it, and it's great to come and learn more about it from you today, Mark. Thank you so much indeed. My pleasure. From a distance, this site may seem barely worthy of note, but as we've learned today, it's a hidden gem in the local, the national, and the international story of steel production. It's also early proof that the north of England would play a key role in the Industrial Revolution, and that England as a whole would be swept up in a pioneering period of manufacturing and industrialization. The area around Derwent Coach Steel Furnace is open all year round, and the furnace itself is open on special days. To find out more, check the English Heritage website.